Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is an Israel Palestine conflict series, a third part of the series. I've given you a bit of a psychological, philosophical, and historical background to the conflict. We are going to continue with the history in this video, but particularly the history of the 20th century up until sort of 1948, uh, because it's absolutely crucial to understand what happens there in order to understand where we're at today. And for those of you who are big fans of the British, I'm sad to say that uh, there's a good deal of involvement by the British. We've also got Russians, uh, French, Italians, Americans, and obviously Palestinians and Jews. Uh, but the British are certainly, they certainly have a heavy hand in what took place. So let's now pop to the Wikipedia page for the Ottoman Empire. It's just a quick synopsis uh, as to what we are dealing with. So that's where we left it last time. The Ottoman Empire or the Turkish Empire control much of Southeast Europe, West Asia, North Africa between the 14th and 20th centuries. Um, we can get an understanding of geographically uh, and historically where they were at. So in the 1480s, it was predominantly centered around uh, Greece and Turkey and pushing into Eastern Europe. Then in 1566, you can see there was a great expansion coming down to uh, parts of the Arabian Peninsula, North Africa, and spreading a little bit eastwards as well towards Persia. And that was, I guess, the, the largest extent of the empire, maybe here, no, it could be in the 1680s here, uh, where you had sort of vassal states of the Ottoman Empire as well. Uh, and then into 1739, a little bit of reduction in the Eastern European area. And then 1914, uh, as we approach the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire and its eventual sort of carving up, it was carved up after the First World War by the still imperialistic nations, I guess, intentions of still holding on to ideas of the Empire of Britain and France, uh, particularly. Uh, but as you can see there, Palestine, the Palestinian region here is firmly in the green, and we're going to be we're going to be dealing a lot with that area. Uh, talking of the First World War, it's interesting to note that actually, in the lead up to the First World Wars, so from 1908, where the Turks themselves came to power within the uh, Ottoman Empire. You, got, you had this nationalism that came to the fore, Turkish nationalism and an Arab nationalism that is really important to understand. And it was the this kind of nationalism that Britain sought to exploit in driving uh, a wedge into uh, a schism between the Turks and the Arabs because the Ottoman Empire was on the side of the Germans in the Second World War. If we look here at the Wikipedia uh, quote or excerpt, the Committee of Union and Progress, CUP, established the second constitutional era in the Young Turk Revolution in 1908, turning the empire into a constitutional monarchy, which conducted competitive multi-party elections. However, after the disastrous Balkan Wars and the now radicalised and nationalistic CUP, so these are nationalised nationalistic Turks, took over the government in the 1913 coup d'etat, creating a one-party regime. The CUP allied the empire with Germany, hoping to escape from the diplomatic isolation which had contributed to its recent territorial losses, and thus joined World War I on the side of the central powers. While the empire was also was able to largely hold its own during the conflict, it was struggling with with internal dissent, especially with the Arab revolt in its Arabian holdings. During this time, the Ottoman government engaged in genocide against the Armenians, Assyrians and Greeks. The empire's defeat in the occupation of part of its territory by the Allied powers in the aftermath of World War I, resulting in its partitioning and the loss of its southern territories, which were divided between the UK and France. The successful Turkish War of Independence led by Ataturk against the occupying allies led to the emergence of the Republic of Turkey in the Anatolian heartland and the abolition of the Ottoman monarchy. But that comes later and we won't really be dealing too much with that. Just as a kind of side note here, uh, talking about the Italian involvement, if we look at the map here of the carving up of the uh, of, of Turkey or the Ottoman Empire 
in and around 1920 here you've got an international zone to the northwest of turkey you've got a italian zone to the south in anatolia you've got a french zone uh, that is next to the french mandate itself next to the british mandate stretching across to iraq and we'll be talking a lot about that going forward you've got armenia at the top as well so that is uh, that is to give you a bit of an understanding of the history and geography so far. So as mentioned, the British were seeking to exploit the nationalism, particularly of the Arabs. In 1915, they recognised that opportunity for exploitation. And with the French, uh, the British thought that they could support the Arabs to break the Ottoman Empire. Uh, at this time, there was Sharif Hussein, who was in secret contact with the British around this kind of 1915 era, and he wanted to create a modern Arab empire and sought British support. So at the same time as the British were starting to do deals with Sharif Hussein, they were also sorting out this agreement with the French that came on to be known that came to be known as the Sykes Picot Agreement. Uh, Britain knew that they needed to have the French involved in carving up the Middle East. Palestine was originally seen as an international area uh, and the British wanted the oil uh, from Iraq. So uh, if we that that was where the, my map should have been. But the um, Sykes-Picot Treaty, which is this French British or British French treaty here saw the two imperial nations, if you like, or nations with imperial um, intentions wanting to carve up the region into very much an A and a B, uh, the French to the north, the British to the south and the east. They, the British wanted the oil in Iraq. Uh, the French had an interest in Syria and to the north with Palestine, that area in yellow and Haifa, uh, Palestine remaining an international zone there. But of course, that doesn't track particularly well with what the uh, British had been saying to entities and, uh, and movers in the area and in history. So just to let you know that Sharif Hussein was a Hashemite. This was a royal family of Jordan. Um, they're the royal family of the kingdoms of Hejaz in 1916 to 25, Syria in 1920, and Iraq 1921 to 58. Uh, they are an important family, uh, as we will see going forward. So remember this chap, Sharif Hussein, uh, that is him there. He is, a, he is a guy that we are going to be uh, concentrating on quite a bit. So in about 1917, the Arabs did revolt against the Turks. And of course, that really did create this schism that the British could uh, exploit in terms of what was going on in, on in the war in Europe. Uh, the British moved across the Suez Canal to Palestine in the south. Uh, all the while, things were not going too well in the war in Europe. The British thought that getting the US involved in the war could be done uh, through appealing to the Jews. And this is the next important idea. So the Americans were in, in support of the war, but they didn't have troops on the ground. And the, and the British thought that appealing to the Jews would have an effect. They had this idea that the Jews around the world were one monolithic entity, even though they're diaspora communities all over the shop and maybe having different experiences and different beliefs, uh, political beliefs and whatnot. But the British were a bit more simplistic in their thinking at the time, wanted appeal to Jews in America to get the Americans more on board. And at the same time, there was a growing Zionist movement, a Zionistic movement uh, in, in Europe, particularly, uh, and in Berlin. And this was as a, a result of a growing anti-Semitism throughout Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe. Um, this Zionism was a belief that Israel Palestine area was their home uh, and it could provide an Israeli state or a Jewish state that would give them safety from the oppression of anti-Semitism. It was inspired by that that big backdrop there. Um, so the the wish to return to a promised land in the offer of hope and security was something that I guess the British could also 
opportunistically exploit in the same way that they were seeking to exploit Arab nationalism against the Turks. Uh, but at this time, it's important to note that, that Jews, indigenous Jews in the Palestine area only represented 8% of the population. Uh, and that is significant because, of course, an awful lot more, 700,000 uh, people were not were non-Jews. So the British were negotiating with a chap called Kaim Weizmann. Now, he is very important in this narrative. So who is he? Well, he's a Russian-born biochemist, so Russian originally, Zionist leader and Israeli statesman who served as the president of the Zionist organization and later the first president of Israel, elected on the 16th of February 1949 and served until his death. He was fundamental in obtaining the Balfour Declaration, hugely important, we'll come on to that in a second, and later convincing the US government to recognize the U newly formed state of Israel. So this guy, incredibly important. This was all happening while the Allies were starting to struggle more in Europe. They reached out to Karim Weizmann because Russia was on the verge of collapse. The Tsar had been deposed. And without proper US support, as in troops on the ground, as mentioned, the Allies would really be in trouble. They needed the Russians to remain in the war to divert German resources and the military and so on and so forth. And British intelligence suggested that Jews were important in the Bolshevik party and the Bolshevik movement. And so someone like Weizmann is important there. Um, Lloyd George thought that without US troops, uh, he had to act. And he issued the Balfour Declaration, which was the result of the then Foreign Secretary, Arthur James Balfour. So he is very famous now for the Balfour Declaration, but he had actually previously been Prime Minister himself. Balfour Declaration is a very short 67 words that can be seen here within this letter from Arthur James Balfour to Lord Rothschild. He says, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. So first of all, this is a declaration that is primarily uh, de declaring sympathy for Zionism. So, quote, and this is the famous Balfour Declaration. His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. So I'm going to pause there. We have the British saying we are in favour of a national home for the Jews in Palestine. But of course, Palestine, there are only 8% of the population are Jewish. So in other words, we are going to somehow create a, an is, a, a Jewish home geographically in a region, which would, one assume, cause the displacement of people who are already living there. But it goes on to say, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. This is, I think, an almost impossible dream. So you're saying we really favour the establishment of a Jewish home in Palestine, but we want don't want to prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities. Well, that's what's going to happen, because if you're going to move people in there, those non-Jewish communities are going to have their right to property and land, perhaps, uh, be infringed. And that, that, is, that is a big problem. OK, so uh, there could be an element of this being an impossible dream. But anyway, the, as British forces began occupying Palestine, the Balfour Declaration was issued. A major European power had given backing. So the British had given backing to a Zionist ideal of a Palestinian homeland. And here's the problem. Sharif Hussein. So remember the uh, Arab leader that the British had exploited to drive a schism in the Ottoman uh, Empire and leadership had also been promised Palestine. So these secret deals with Sharif didn't quite match up 
with these Sharif Hussain with these secret deals uh, or I guess not so secret with the declaration with the Balfour Declaration. So as mentioned, Jews only comprised 80,000 perhaps out of 700,000 people in Palestine. But even then, it was beginning to be identified in the West as Jewish land. And the indigenous habit inhabitants were being referred to as non-Jewish inhabitants. So it's almost as Jewishness is the default uh, there and that other people are just non-Jewish inhabitants. They're the majority, but they're seen in light of their Jewishness or non-Jewishness. Do you see what I mean? Anyway, uh, Russia pulled out of the war. And this is massively problematic for the British, pulled out of the war and released the secret treaties that they were privy to. This then meant that Arabs completely suspected the British of foul play in terms of granting them independence, self-determination and division into different zones. So you can see back to this Sykes-Picot map that the Russians releasing this was highly embarrassing for the British because they were doing deals with Sharif Hussein to say, yeah, you can have self-determination. And I assume, you know, agreeing that he could have an Arab state while at the same time doing the Balfour Declaration saying, well, we kind of favour a Jewish home homeland there in that yellow area. What's also saying that we're going to carve up the whole region between the British and French anyway. Uh, but that was not... Uh, something that was well known outside the French uh, and British kind of decision making corridors, uh, obviously the Russians as well. Uh, so that was all highly controversial. So it is a case of needing to get Sharif Hussein back on side to some uh, some extent. Uh, because, of course, the Arabs then realised that the British and French had their own agenda. The British appeased Hussein, who remained loyal to the British for the time being. So now the British are in Jerusalem. Weizmann seized the initiative. So it's Chaim Weizmann, if you remember, the, uh, the Zionist, and visited Palestine to look into creating a Hebrew university to act as a Zionist hub. Arabs were not happy, not happy with Weizmann being there and doing that, as it looked like the British uh, and General Allenby, who was there with the British Army, would follow through with the Balfour Declaration. In 1918, Allenby pushed through into Damascus together with the Arab Faisal, who is Sharif Hussein's son, and his army, they pushed the Ottomans north. And this gave the British military uh, advantage and the Arab backing that they needed. So th with their Arab allies, they pushed the Ottomans uh, north and had had control over that territory. And this was kind of coming on towards the end of the First World War. But another problem maybe for Sharif Hussein or for his son Faisal is that instead of Faisal becoming ruler of Syria, as I think he was expecting, the British were going to give Syria to France, as you can see by the Sykes-Picot map there. So what happened is they gave governorship to Faisal, which wasn't quite what he wanted. Uh, but he said about planning to turn it into an Arab state. And this is the end of World War One. So rather than carving up the world for the old empires of France and Britain, which is what they wanted to do, as you can see from the map here in the Sykes-Picot Agreement, when we started coming towards the Versailles peace agreements. Woodrow Wilson, the US president, was much more for self-determination. You can imagine he's come off the back of, you know, America flourishing after the being under the shackles of British rule um, and the British Empire. So he's not for these uh, imperial powers going around the world and carving up the world for their own agendas. He's much more for self-determination and liberation you know, the Habsburgs and the Ottomans. Uh, but the problem is, is that that wasn't quite in, in accord with what the, some of the European leaders and, and countries wanted. Britain had made pledges by this time pretty much to the Arabs, the Jews, the French, the Russians. And then during the, the uh, Versailles discussions, Faisal came along and he was pleading for Arab statehood. But you know what? When you made promises to so many people, that was probably not going to happen. Indeed, 
If we uh, look at, I think it was Balfour again. Uh, so this is a really good Medium article, if you want to, I'll try and remember to put all the links uh, in the description below. Talks about the Balfour Declaration and how important it was. Uh, but if we come down here to a memo from Balfour after the war, we can see, you know, what was really being thought by the people uh, deciding these eventualities. Regarding the promise made to the Jews, Arthur Balfour issued a private memo during the peace treaty in Versailles, quote, the four great powers are committed to Zionism. So that's interesting in itself. And Zionism, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is rooted in age long traditions, in present needs, in future hopes of far profounder import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit the ancient land. Whoa, right, let's back up. This is a massive prejudice by Balfour towards Jews over Muslims and anyone else living in the area. So he's saying that it doesn't matter what you morally think about Zionism, it's traditional and much more important in the, the people's desires and prejudices than the Arabs. That seems pretty unjustified and quite problematic. In short, so far as Palestine is concerned, the powers have made no statement of fact which is not admittedly wrong and no declaration of policy which, at least in the letter, they have not always intended to violate. Holy cow. In other words, we're basically going to violate uh, that's how I understand it. All these sort of declarations of policy, you know, it's it's going to be a. This is inviting the whole situation to be a right hot mess. Goodness me. The Versailles Peace Conference ended in 1919, and it declared that such territories should be administered by mandates. In other words, Britain and France could rule the Arab territories. Britain handed over power to the French of Syria, but Faisal was proclaimed king by the Syrian National Congress, and he fled to Palestine. So that is uh, an important development. Let's go and try and uh, see this on a map. So we have you know, Syria in this general area up here. The He was governor of Syria, and then the Syrian National Congress made Faisal king and the French didn't like that and he fled. The whole region had been divided into two imperial mandates and peoples there had not been allowed self-determination which would have been the ideal of Woodrow Wilson but also the ideal of the people there themselves. So this was in effect the manifestation of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The Ottoman Greater Syria became the French mandate for Lebanon and Syria and Transjordan and Palestine became the British mandate there was also the oil-rich Iraq that was given to Britain in the east. This is essentially what it looked like. Uh, so you had the independent Republic of Turkey, French mandate is Syria, British mandate of Mesopotamia, including Iraq, and then the British mandate of Palestine here, which included, obviously, the area that the Jews wanted to call their homeland or wanted to settle in uh, if given the opportunity. The Iraqi people rejected British rule until Faisal was installed as king there in 1921. But his father, Sharif Hussein, expected more. He still uh, felt he had been promised Arab independence by the British. His other son, Abdullah, became king of Transjordan. This was a desire for Hashemite rule. Uh, and of course, the Hashemites were the royal family of Jordan. And, you know, they wanted this Hashemite or Sharif Hussein wanted this Hashemite rule across the region uh, in charge of an Arab state. His rival, Ibn Saud, conquered the whole of Arabia, however, ridding that area of Hashemites. And that was a real thorn in the side 
of Sharif Hussein. So this chap, Ibn Saud, he was an Arab political and religious leader who founded Saudi Arabia. Uh, as king, he presided over the discovery of petroleum in Saudi Arabia in 1938 and the beginning of large-scale oil production after World War II. Uh, so an important uh, historical figure for sure. In 1920, the British administered Jerusalem without intending to devolve power. Uh, three religions existed there. You had Muslims in the majority, you had Christians, and then the smallest community were the Jews themselves. The Balfour Declaration, however, was incorporated into the Versailles um, mandate. So the peace agreement of Versailles codified, if you like, the Balfour Declaration. And this opened the door for European Jewish immigration. I think that's super important. You start seeing more and more Jewish people, not indigenous Jews, but diaspora Jews, European Jews, returning, or as they, as they saw it, returning to their homeland. Of course, that's not how other people in the area would have seen it. Avi Shlaim, the uh, professor of international relations at Oxford, saw it this way, and I think this is an absolutely brilliant quote. The Arabs had a strong case, but very poor advocates. The Zionists had a case. It wasn't as strong as the local Arabs, but they had brilliant advocates. Zionism is one of the greatest public success stories of the 20th century. Kaim Weizmann exemplified these traditional Jewish skills of advocacy and persuasion. I think it's such a good way of putting it. The Jews had a case. It just wasn't crazy strong. And the Arabs had a really strong case, but they didn't have people who were good enough to, to persuade the British, or I wouldn't say good enough, but maybe the right people to persuade the British. Chaim Weizmann appeared to be very good at uh, persuading, at doing PR and at advocating for the Jews. And kind of that that's what led to this, uh, the burgeoning um, support for the Zionist case, I think, amongst particularly the British here. Uh, Weizmann then started financing land purchases for immigrant Jews. So you're now starting to see large scale immigration have an effect on the area where they are buying up land, they're settling. And indeed, if I take you to this very good, and I advise uh, any of you guys to watch this very good documentary on YouTube, it's a free documentary. It's how Britain started the Arab Israeli conflict. So we'll join it here uh, towards the end. Now, unfortunately, I recorded, edited, and uploaded the video, uh, and there was a copyright infringement for the excerpt from the documentary I'm just about to use. So I'm now going to have to record it with myself doing the speaking. So apologies for that. But this is what was said. This is Avi Shleim, who I spoke about earlier, and he says the following. Uh, I believe that the Balfour Declaration was one of the biggest mistakes in British imperial history. It committed Britain to support of Jewish nationalism in Palestine after the war, and it did not produce any immediate benefits for Britain. So that's Avi Shleim himself that I just quoted earlier. Just to say that the Balfour Declaration is one of the biggest British imperial historical mistakes. I mean, is is a huge claim, and it did, you know, set up for, uh, well, for a conflict that has been ongoing for an awful long time. And then the next interviewee uh, says the following: Without the Balfour Declaration, there could have been a genuine development of a Jewish national home and the follow through in 1948 where you get a state of Israel simply would not have happened. It requires the umbrella of the British to be there in effect to support the emerging Jewish national home militarily at the bottom line. The very fact that there are British troops, British policemen there to protect the Jewish communities is ultimately central to the situation. It could not have been done any other way. And I think that is incredibly astute.
massively important, I think, that and uh, very well stated there by the documentary interviewees. So Jewish immigration into Palestine in the 30s and 40s then grew hugely. So you started seeing a lot more Jewish people come and settle in the area, sanctioned by the British. Uh, the Palestinians saw this as an alien incursion and by the Jews as a fulfillment of historic rights. Uh, and this led to itself to polarization and then violence. Arab terrorism led to the British putting immigration uh, restrictions on uh, incoming Jews, but then that led to Jewish terrorism. So it was like this escalation of violence, which still seems to be a thing. Uh, and this is when the British kind of stepped back and the state of Israel, Israel was created uh, in 1948. Jewish and Arab nationalism were promoted by Britain at different times here for different aims and agendas and nurtured. And as the documentary says, it's British double dealing and betrayal. Uh, they very clearly say that in the documentary that helped to cement the foundations for the ongoing conflict. And this is why I say the British had such a major hand in where we are now in in the conflict and of course things have have gone on from there and there's a lot of activity that that can't be laid at the feet of the british of course with what what say israelis and palestinians have themselves done for the last 70 years but even as you see from this sykes pico map here palestine was uh, in this yellow area was a, an area where other people third parties not the people living there had decided that that was going to be an international uh, territory. And then as we go forward, uh, we see that it becomes part of the British mandate of Palestine. Again, it's 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 British deciding you know, who gets to live there and what takes place. It's not an area where people have the right to self-determination. And I think it's really important to understand this historical context. I think it, it gives us uh, a really good platform to start uh, trying to understand the conflict now, but certainly the next sort of 70 years on from there, uh, it's really important to understand the place that this region has uh, on the chessboard of kind of geopolitical imperial uh, players at the time. It is a, a place that has been, and a time, I guess, that has been forged in the furnaces of British and French imperialism. And I think it's important that we understand that. Because if you don't understand that, then I, I, d I don't think you get a fair grasp of why people have grievances and what's going on and what has taken place there in the last 70 years or so. So anyway, hopefully that was of use. Please let me know. I'm not a historical expert, right? So let me know if I've made any erroneous claims in the in the threads below. Remember, this is a really divisive subject. So try to be respectful in the comments. That includes comments to me, if you can, if you, if you think I've, I've really misspoken, let, I'm happy to be shown to be wrong. But this is a conflict that people have polarised very much. Uh, and as I say, it's very divisive. And it's very easy to get embroiled in very vindictive arguments full of invective. And we need to kind of take a step away and say, right, I, I'm really trying to understand this region and understand this conflict. And hopefully this helps to do that. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Please take care and speak soon.